when you grow up in the hood, in particular in the 70s and the 80s, you guys know this. You just play whatever sport that season <laughs> is. Baseball <laughs> season, we play baseball. And then football season, the exact same thing. Your physique is that of a I basketball player. I was a skinny player. kid in the neighborhood with bumps <laughs> on his face and bad teeth. Make a long story short, I remember getting tackled or whatever and I chipped my tooth. I started to look up to public figures who also had bad teeth and embraced it. So like too short, that was my guy because I appreciated people that had their flaws like me, but it seems like they still, it didn't stop them from being successful. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two And now she's gonna break down It's a breakdown She's gonna break it down My and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Athletic Greens There are so many stressors in life And it can be really hard to maintain Effective nutritional habits And give our bodies what they need to thrive I mean, my schedule's insane I don't always get enough sleep Like I try to exercise, but like sometimes that makes me more tired. That's where Athletic Greens comes in. It's a life-changing nutritional habit. It is the easiest, most delicious nutritional habit you can add to your routine. What Athletic Greens has done is they've simplified the logistics of getting the nutrition that you need by giving you one thing that has all of the best things in it. So one scoop has 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. If if you're keto, if you're paleo, if you're vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, if you don't like sugar, this is for you. And they've got you for year-round immune support by offering our audience a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash breakdown. Get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. We're going to do the heavy lifting here. Got a very exciting guest today, Jalen Rose. (laughs) He's a very famous basketball player. This is very exciting. But first, I'd like to introduce you to my favorite All-American, Jonathan Cohen. (laughs) Hello, Mayim. People are going to be confused. So confused. Because I carry my little Canadian flag here. But the All-American reference is to basketball players. That's right. The high school All-Americans. The best of the best get to play in the McDonald's Classic, is that? Yeah. Jalen Rose is widely considered to be one of the elite, hardest working talents in sports and entertainment media. He was in the NBA for 13 years. He's also a New York Times bestselling author. He was a member of the Fab Five at the University of Michigan, and he was drafted by the Denver Nuggets in uh, 1994. He went on to play for six NBA teams. Name them. So, so Nuggets. Nuggets. Uh, Indiana Pacers. Indiana Pacers. Chicago Bulls. Chicago Bulls. Raptors. He, we had him for a while. Toronto Raptors. Then he went to the for Knicks. For one, one season to the Knicks, New York went, Knicks. Then he went to the Suns. That's right. And then he went to the Suns. He also does Jalen and Jacoby. Great uh, yep. video series. He's also just like an amazing NBA analyst now. Well, so he started his broadcast journalism career in the midst of his 2002 NBA season and he went full throttle. That's right. His bio says full throttle by signing with ABC ESPN after retiring in 2007. He covers a wide range of current events in sports and entertainment. Um, I'm going to actually be on his podcast. We'll tell all of our friends about that. Um, He is. He's a renaissance man. He also writes for the New York Post, which is... uh, which is awesome. He's spoken publicly about having ADHD. We actually don't cover it in the interview today, but he talks about a lot of things in a really sensitive and fleshed out way. He's very self-reflective. Yes. Great storyteller. It's very exciting. I, I'm a huge basketball fan. You are as well, which we'll, we'll talk about with him. And it's just really, it's, it's very exciting. We, we also, we talk about mental health and the impact of the, the stress on mental health. He's a fascinating person and everybody needs to listen. That's all I have to say. I don't have anything else to say. I mean, I was a yes. competitive, casual athlete, meaning like I was never thought that I would go anywhere with sports, but I always played a ton. And I always said that basketball was yeah. one of my greatest teachers, the level of dealing with anxiety, being in the flow, when to p- uh, assign effort, when Very to pull difficult. back, when to let things come to you versus assert yourself, um, how to move it within like a flow state was all well, a huge learning. And I thought basketball rep- reflected life for me so greatly. It's interesting because as a person who likes baseball and likes football, I mean, very much, and and likes football very much and likes basketball very much, 
you know, there's the downtime you get in basketball is when you are impotent, meaning when you're benched, you're not meaning you're not being used. So in football, it's a it's a sport of stopping and starting. I mean, like, I'm sure there's some amazing statistic for the longest play that I can't pull out of my brain right now. But it's a stop and start game. It's a game of inches. Like, literally, it's a game of inches. You stop, you start this, that. Baseball is a game of, of waiting. You know, like most people who are on, I love comparing sports as like a thing. Um, so baseball, you wait all the time. That's why there's all those obsessive compulsive things that they do because you're just waiting. It's a game of nail biting and chewing tobacco, which is very bad for you. That's right. I said tobacco. But basketball is a game of flow. Of flow. And you and can go. And leads and yeah. rhythm change. I mean, I could talk all about it all day, but it's a very different mental state because you're also, you're part of a team and yet you can really in any position have a tremendous impact on the game at any given time. One player can impact the game more, I think, in basketball. I'm feeling than a little verklempt. That's how excited I am about this conversation. Many other sports. Before we talk to Jalen, two yes. things to look out for. Number one, stick around to the end of the episode where the divine itself changes the lights in the background. That's as, we, as we talk about divinity. And check out the new MBB Instagram page. Yes. At Bialik Breakdown. We're building a following. The breakers have the, spoken. The army of breakers. That's right. Army feels kind of hostile. Conglomerate. Also, corporation. All right, stop. Collection of. Let's welcome Jalen Rose. Jalen. Break it down. Thank you. Appreciate the love. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my gosh. We're very excited. Um, we've, we've both been enjoying your book. <laughs> we've enjoyed it so much that Jonathan took the cover off. I lost the cover. He lost the cover. And I was like, I just saw it. And he's like, I don't know where it is. So this looks so tacky that we're showing you your book. That's dedication. That's exactly. That's that's how much we... I have notes in the back. He got it I'm all dirty. It. Like, <laughs> yeah. appreciate the love. That's dedication. That's giving the people what they want. We need to give you a little bit of background here. We're both very, very large basketball fans in general. Um, I I was born in 1975, and Jonathan was born in 79. So I I grew up. I grew up a Knicks fan because my parents are from the Bronx and my father and I were Knicks fans. And I'm like the Patrick Ewing just like died in the blue and orange. Like I'm like a Spike Lee kind of a spectator. Yeah. Like yeah. I grew up watching some fantastic Knicks. Disappointments. Also, di is what you know what? That is really not nice. <laughs> I grew up. I mean, we worship Patrick Ewing and his baseline jumper. Like it was... Yeah. It was a holy thing. We would come home from synagogue on Rosh Hashanah to watch the Knicks in the finals. Like, it was a very big deal. Jonathan, who is Canadian, and that's his own Toronto Raptors story, um, we we have a sports connection together because he's the closest I can come to dating an NBA star. He's very <laughs> tall in the Jewish community. He's a very <laughs> skilled basketball player. And this is as good as it gets, Jalen. <laughs> While Jalen is known for many things more than his stint on the Raptors, he'll always be a Raptor to me. Thank you, bro. Appreciate the love. He'll always be a Nick to me. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate the love. Okay. Enough of us. Um, you you wrote this book a handful of years ago, um, yeah. but it really it it highlights some of the things that that you are known for and some of the things that people best know you for, which is being very, very honest, very, very candid. Um, you are not only an accomplished and, and legendary player, um, but you, you're also um, a, a sports expert and someone that people turn to for reflections and perspective about basketball and, and kind of sport in general. If you don't mind, like, Tell us a little bit about your childhood. You grew up in Detroit, um, mm -hmm. really heartland of America and uh, the, the home of, of cars is what most people think about. Um, but tell us a little bit about kind of growing up and, you know, keeping in mind that we're a mental health podcast. So we're very interested in any time you want to talk about your feelings. We nice. can talk ball, but we can also talk feelings. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me on. And you must look at the story of me stealing Patrick Ewan's TV. I told it on Grantland <laughs> 10 years ago. Iconic. It is iconic. Um, my childhood, I was born in 1973, northwest side of Detroit. 
didn't realize that not knowing my father wasn't normal because that was basically the entire neighborhood. So being in a single parent home didn't feel different to me at all. And also in the early 70s, Detroit was still at one of its apexes. The auto industry was flourishing. Also Motown sound movement with Barry Gordy. So Detroit became an epicenter in a lot of ways of the United States for people from the South in particular to migrate, to come to Detroit and get jobs at the plant. Hmm. And usually either right out of high school in particular, you could go get one of those jobs that your family could be thriving. And then also a part of my childhood was remnants of like uh, the, the ending of like segregated United States. You know, Detroit had the riots in the late 60s and a couple of notable, you know, um, uh, uh, riots that took place that kind of became remnants of my childhood as it related to black and white relations because Detroit is a really segregated city in a lot of ways. And so once the 80s hit and uh, uh, crack became um, something that infested the neighborhood uh, and heroin and, and, and drugs, and all of a sudden we started to see a lot of flight. We started to see a lot of families get affected by drugs, um, using and selling, a lot of people getting incarcerated. A lot of the laws started changing under Reagan through Bill Clinton and the incarceration laws and, and three strike laws and things of that nature. And so we started to see a town that went from having 2 million people in the 60s and the 70s to be ravaged by drugs and violence to now it's currently a town that has maybe 600,000 people hmm. to show you the difference and uh, how things have changed uh, from then to now. Did you have this notion of like, I want to get out of here? Like, did it feel like, what are the pathways out? Were you naturally athletic? Did you think of that as kind of like, this is going to be a thing to do? I don't mean get out, because that also oh, sounds you. kind of strange. I know exactly what you mean. So being the youngest of four, two older brothers and a sister, they had a different father. And as I mentioned, my father played in the NBA, was an all-star, was the number one pick in the draft. And I never met him, never knew him, never talked to my mom about him really until I started like getting to high school, never really brought him up. I, I, I was I, I was a kid that was a product of my environment. Um, and, and usually, and, and Notorious Big once said, either you sling, crack, rock, or you got a wicked jump shot. Mm -hmm. So it became a choice in a lot of ways. Do I want to be an athlete? Do I want to be a student? Do I want to be a hustler? Do I want to be all three? Because you still need, in a lot of ways, to contribute to the family when you're poor. So there are times when if I'm an able-bodied, you know, 11, 12, 13-year-old and my mother's lights getting cut off and we don't have hot water, I got to try to find a way to contribute. Hmm. Just how it has to be. And some of that ends up being the wrong decisions. And then it started an entrepreneur spirit for me where I started to um, not want to steal cars with my friends or not want to sell drugs because I saw everybody was doing it. And so I started to have a paper route. I started to shovel snow and cut people's grass, carry people's bags at the grocery store or pump gas at the gas station. So I, I was one of those type of kids that felt like I, I knew I couldn't go to my mother to ask her for money because she was already struggling as a key puncher working at Chrysler, working 40 hours a week, a single parent type of thing. And plus she had a night job as well as a, uh, as a waitress. So there was times where I used to go to work with my mother. So I spent a lot of time in the bar environment mm -hmm. when I was young too. And that was one of my hustles, going to buy cigarettes from the cigarette machine, going to the store, warming up their cars, wiping off their cars in the winter time, kind of assisting my mom. You know, I, I, I've had as many Shirley Temples as any <laughs> uh, listen before 15, trust me. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Or do you just feel like 
you're not exactly living the life that you want to live, well, BetterHelp can assess your needs and match you with a licensed professional therapist who you can start communicating with in under 48 hours. It's available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account and send a message to your therapist anytime. You get responses and you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. Visit their website, read their testimonials. I actually signed my mom up for BetterHelp. We were amazed how easy it was for her an older person not familiar with tech to use the app and get her first appointment literally in under 24 hours hers came in. Visit betterhelp.com slash break. That's better H-E-L-P and join the over 2 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp. Jonathan, what have they done? The recruiting therapists in all 50 states. Additional therapists in all 50 states. Special offer for our listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash break. My and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Helix. Helix, the mattress I never knew I needed until my kids got one and I wouldn't get off their beds. And literally, they were like, get your own. So I did. Helix Sleep has a quiz. This is how you figure out which mattress is right for you. It's like a two minute quiz. It matches your body type and your sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you because that makes sense, right? Why would you buy a mattress that wasn't good for how you sleep or what you're like? I took the quiz and I love my mattress very, very much. I no longer have to hang out on my kids' beds is really what it is. The mattress comes right to your door, shipped for free. You don't ever need to go to a mattress store again. Go to helixsleep.com slash breakdown, take the quiz, and they'll match you to the mattress that is the best sleep of your life. There's a 10-year warranty and try it out for 100 nights risk-free. What have you got to lose? They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash breakdown. That's helixsleep.com slash breakdown for up to $200 off and two free pillows. I mean, this might sound like a, it might sound like a crazy question, but was it clear that because you didn't, you didn't know who, who your, who your, your, your biological father was. And he finds out in a pretty yeah, no, no, no. astonishing like, wait, way. In we'll the book. get to that. We won't, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But was it like, oh my gosh, I'm really tall and I'm a really good athlete. Is it possible my dad was a basketball player? Like, did that occur to you? No, because when you grow up in the hood, in particular in the 70s and the 80s, you guys know this. You just play whatever sport that season <laughs> is. <laughs> that's how this worked. So during baseball season, we played baseball. We played right. fast pitch. We played softball. We played hardball. We played with a tennis ball. Like we played wiffle ball. Like during <laughs> the, the baseball season, we played baseball. And then football season, the exact same thing. Okay, but your your body type, your physique is that of a basketball player. I was just a skinny kid in the neighborhood <laughs> with, with 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 bumps on his face and bad teeth. Like one of the times I was playing on um, pick them up, mess them up. That's a football game, and uh, all of a sudden, like it's like it's touching, it's, it's touch on the concrete, but it's tackle on the grass, especially in the winter time. Right, and so make a long story short, I remember getting tackled or whatever, and I chipped my tooth, and I started to look up to public figures who also had bad teeth and embraced it. I sure did. So like too short, that was my guy. The <laughs> rapper, that was my man. I, and I, because I appreciated people that had their flaws like me, but it seems like they still it didn't stop them from being successful. You and me, we're the same person. I got messed up teeth too. Yeah, you know what I mean? And so like I, I used all of that, I was using all of that as motivation. So basketball season came. Yes, I was more dominant in basketball. But I wasn't like I was the oldest, so it wasn't like all I was the biggest or the strongest or the best. Because in the hood, it, when you're at the park, it don't matter how old you are. Like uh, I'm tall and I'm 11 or 12. I got 22 year olds trying to muscle me still. Right. So that that so I, th that's kind of how I fell in love with sports. I was one of those kids that you know played whatever play whatever sport whatever season it was happening. 
then as you get into your sort of mid later teens, you start to take basketball more seriously. And, and you, there's an amazing moment where you're, I forget the exact team, but you're on a team, your brother comes to watch you and you sort of have a decision to like get serious or not. You're, you describe yourself as a bit of a joker. You, you clearly got skills, but you're like, you know, n- not utilizing them yet. Can you describe that moment where you're like, right. okay, I gotta, I gotta dial this in if I'm going to be, be real on this. Well, well, a lot of things was happening during my middle school years because that's when puberty kicks in, that's when poverty really kicks in. And, and, and so I got into a, a couple of fights and then after seventh grade, I got school and they didn't allow me to come back. And so the period of time you're talking about is a pivotal time in my life because either I could have went towards the streets or I could rededicate myself to the game. And... I, I, I just I just recall Sam Washington bringing me into the gym and like dusting off an old projector and saying, "This is your father." Oh. He showed me my biological father. He was like he was the first guy doing spin dribbles. Like he had game. Look at this. Like he went to Providence. Like look, anybody look it up. Like my biological father, one of the greatest basketball players in collegiate history. Like he averaged like thirty five. Like anybody from the East Coast. Asked him about Jimmy Walker. Like, he's a legend in getting buckets, right? <laughs> and, and he was like, this is your father. You messing around, whatever, whatever. You don't got kicked out of school. Like, your life is about to be whatever, whatever. And he didn't let me come to the camp that summer. And that killed me. <laughs> oh, man, I can't go to Sam Washington summer camp. Oh, that killed me so much. Oh, man. And then so, like, once eighth grade happened, I started playing at, uh, uh, that, that summer, I started playing for the Super Friends. And my brother came home from the military and we were playing at Saginaw. And like, I was on the team, but I wasn't like playing to my potential. I had just got kicked off the team. Like it just wasn't a good summer. It was not a, it was not a good summer. You know, I'm, I was on punishment a lot. It was just not a good summer. And so we had a tournament. My brother came, it was like an hour drive and we won. And I was celebrating with the team. You know, I played like two minutes. We won. Hey, we going to the national. My brother pulled me to the side. Like, let me tell you something. I just flew all the way here from Seattle and then drove two, two hours. And you out here cheering and y'all score. And you ain't score? Like, no, nah, we not having it. And I'm going to tell you something. That was in June. When we went to the nationals that year in August, I was an All-American. Mm. I play every day, every day, all day. I fell in love. Like, I'm about to start taking this serious. And then I, for my eighth grade, I went to a school called Precious Blood that was in my neighborhood. And somebody just reminded me of a game where our team had, like, 54 points, and I had 42 of them. <laughs> <laughs> True story. And then that's just what led to me going to Detroit Southwestern a legendary high school led by Perry Wilde. Wow. What I love about that is you had raw t- talent. You had the ability. You didn't have the focus or the discipline yet. And it took all of that coming together for you to like lock in. And you're like this, you got, you got that setback, you know, it's the pivotal in any hero's journey. <laughs> you got to get knocked down that one time before you like really put on your ass and you have that choice to make. Absolutely. And, and also the streets are always there, too. You know, you start getting exposed to drinking 40 ounces. I've had a couple of OEs, some wild Irish rolls, some old English, some Cisco. You guys know that you know, heard of those bottles before. <laughs> Bad Dog 2020. I know I ain't speaking a foreign language to y'all. I heard I was born. He's Canadian. I know what you're talking about. I don't know what they drink up there north of the border. Just moose juice. Just moose juice. <laughs> <laughs> Life becomes a series of choices. And um, while I wasn't always making the best choices, it seemed like, you know, I always had divine intervention and some sort of faith. Uh, and, and love from my family and, and from above that continued to guide me. Um, I do want to mention your name because your name, because of you, became one of the most popular boys' names in the 90s and early 2000s. And your name is, your mother crafted it from yes. the J.A. from James, right, for your father and her brother, Len, right? Correct. 
So all those people who teased you, they can go suck an egg. <laughs> suck an egg, all of you. <laughs> suck an egg for teasing those of us with unusual names. <laughs> there are players in the NBA now named Jalen. Like, it's really, it's super, super amazing. You went to Michigan. You had a, a, a college experience. W was that exciting for you? Were you like, yeah, I get to go to college. Were you excited to play ball? Were you excited kind of for the whole experience? What was that like? I'm so I'm so very fortunate about my basketball experiences because the world got a chance to get introduced to me on an international stage at the University of Michigan. I was really fortunate enough that I went to a storied high school as well and had a legendary high school career as well. So for me, I felt like I was on my way to be the next Magic Johnson. That's how I saw myself. Like my mother and I... Uh, who I lost in February. I miss miss her so much. Hmm. And we used to always joke that you could be the greatest of all time, but you'll never be better than Magic. Because <laughs> that was that was her favorite player. And now my favorite player. And so like going to Southwestern and winning a couple of city and state championships and being a McDonald's All American and 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 and, and playing dominant in the Detroit PSL is all that mattered to me. Because it was so many people that came before me, Spencer Haywood and Derek Comas and Steve Smith, Doug Smith. It's like once I get to Michigan, the, the world felt like we were freshmen or the stage was too big. We were like, it's our turn we to make a name for ourselves. Like we crafted, we planned that. We were at the McDonald's All-American. It was four of us. We made it to where we had an adjoining room. And we sat and talked and we made, we're going to go undefeated. We're going to win four championships. <laughs> we'll do everything, you know, like, and so once the Fab Five happened, the beauty of it and uh, the, the, the reason why it's so organic, I, I, I'm so, for the people love our group, shout to Ray, Jimmy, Chris, and Juwan, is that we didn't realize that we were loved or hated. It was an exhale. It truly was. I, like, I was an inner city kid. For me, I was like, I'm out the hood. I'm in Ann Arbor. Like, I'm riding <laughs> past Bob Evans. Like, I'm going in there, getting food, eating, walking out without paying. I'm like, I like this summer <laughs> living. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I got to always pay for my gas. I'm like, you can pay for the gas and hit head off. I'm like, you know, that's old school for you youngsters out there. But, <laughs> but like... Like it, it was organic. It, it, it's fun. And uh, I'm just really grateful. What was it like leaving your mom? Because you were the youngest. Yeah. Yes. What was that like? Um, yeah, I'm curious. What was that like? Because obviously you have this really strong brotherhood, you know, and I think that's right. that's really beautiful. Like that's in my fantasy of what it's like when I play in the NBA. I have like this group of people and like they're my people and like that's who I hang out with and that's who I get to socialize with. But you also were very close with your mom and I'm curious what that was like. Well, the, the number one thing seriously is that like when you're the youngest and, and my sister who's older than me is five years older than me, it, she had different iterations with like her kids. So it's like mm -hmm. my two brothers and then my sister and then me being the youngest. And so it, it became a, a, a friendship, a partnership. Um, it's more than just, you know, mother, son. Like there were times where I would try to do little things to contribute to her because I knew she worked really hard. We never had a cleaning person or a babysitter or stuff like that. And so I remember times when we had kerosene heaters in the house because the heat was cut off or boiling um, water to take a bath. And I just remember taking her car when I was like 14. I didn't have my license to this gas station. I used to open at like 6, 6.30 in the winter and trying to fill up the, the kerosene heaters and turn them on for her so the house can be a little warmer for her when she got up. Like stuff like that. I started to feel like I, I was her bodyguard. I needed to you know, protect her and get out of the situation that we were in. So that became my motivation at Michigan, that I'm not going to go too far away. So I took visits to UNLV and to Syracuse. Those are actually my favorite schools. I took a visit because they had Detroit players ball. 
Anderson Hunt was the final four MVP. He went to Detroit Southwest, like my big brother. Derek Holman went to Syracuse, falling in the final four, like my big brother. Hmm. And so, like, leaving my mother was but not too far because Ann Arbor was only, you know, like a 35-minute drive, and she hmm. still could be at, many, as, be at as many games as possible. While there's so much beauty to – you know, to your college years. Um, I do want to talk about something that you speak about in the book. And I feel like I knew this, but then I relearned it again when I got to this part of your book. So Mitch Album is a writer. <laughs> and um, I, I happen to have, um, I mean, I've read several of his books. He wrote Tuesdays with Maury and The Five People You Meet in Heaven. And, you know, he's a very, very skilled and, and really beautiful writer. In 1993, and this is, these are your words, he took it upon himself to seek out the father I hadn't had any contact with in 20 years, and on the eve of one of the biggest games of my career, handed me a letter with no warning. So this is a very, very strange, and this is not, I'm not asking you to disparage, you know, Mitch Album. you're very, very kind to him. It's a bit of a shady thing to I do. I mean, it, okay, but no, no, but I don't I don't want to be like, oh, we're going to talk about how shady that was. I'm curious kind of like the impact of that because you had already shouldered so much. I mean, you had shouldered so much responsibility from the time that you were a kid. And you were entering a, a, a phase of your life where you were about to enter the NBA, you know, in not very long. And this bit of information then becomes available to you against your will. What what did that feel like? Meaning, like, what was the impact for you? Like, how do you how do you consolidate that information? I felt violated. And how about this? To this day, I'm probably the only person that's been featured in a best selling that has never read it. To this day, I've never read the five of. I, I try not to like take things personal. Now, uh, as a media member, I see what he was trying to do. But also as an adult, thinking back to a, a young, impressionable mind, I understand it can have the same adverse effect. Hmm. And I realized that it did have that effect. And so I, I didn't appreciate that. And so much so, that I kept the letter for like six or seven years, carried it around with me like Linus in the blanket, and I never even opened it. Hmm. So imagine if I wasn't ready to open it for six or seven years after I got it, I definitely wasn't ready for whatever was in it when he gave it to me. Hmm. Well, I just, it speaks so much to our mental clarity when we're doing anything. Sports is like the highest level of that for me. It's like a reflection of the rest of our lives. Like when, and I think now it's more understood than ever before, but it used to be, I don't know, like 20, even 30 years ago, it was all about the who's got the best physical ability. Right. Versus now the mastery, the mental mastery of the game, the mental mastery of yourself, getting in the flow, understanding how, and like to have something come out of the blue like that. Well, and I think, I think also part of that is a, a product of the culture that we grew up in. I remember the day that Magic Johnson announced his retirement. It was like, I was at work, I was an actress when I was a kid. The whole world stopped to watch that press conference. But I remember that like, I didn't know anything about Patrick Ewing. Like, I didn't know anything about Larry Bird, really. Like, there was a new era that evolved as we were young where you started learning about that these are people. And, like, I don't mean to get all emotional, but I will. Like, this is something also that, you know, Spike Lee would talk about a lot. Like, this is not, this is not property that you get to shuffle around for your amusement. There are human beings playing this game. And, and I think that th this era has opened up now where we get to see all the levels of our athletes. There's a mental process. You, I mean, exactly what you said. It's not just about, oh, you can score the most baskets. Like, and Michael Jordan was the next, you know? I mean, Bo was the next of that. Like, these are people. They're multifaceted people. My and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Foria. You know what we believe here? Sex should be fun. <laughs> I mean, life should be fun, but sex should also be fun. 80% of women don't reach orgasm through sex or penetration alone. And sexual intimacy is good for you, solo or 
with a partner you trust. It invokes joy. It nurtures inner well-being. It gives us a glow inside and out. And that's science. I'm being totally serious. Too many women, too many people with vulvas experience sexual pain or discomfort. Up to 75% report pain or discomfort. Foria is an intimacy line that uses all natural botanicals like kava to make sex more comfortable by relieving mental or physical tension and discomfort. Foria is offering a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first order by visiting www.foriawellness.com slash Mayam or use code Mayam at checkout. That's F-O-R-I-A wellness.com forward slash Mayam for 20% off your first order. You will thank us later. These are really, really lovely products and they're very, very helpful. Go to foriawellness.com forward slash Mayam. Mayam Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Ring. Ring Alarm is protection, but it's also peace of mind. It is a powerful, affordable home security system that you can easily install yourself, which is very exciting for people like me who don't think that anything is easy to install. Ring Alarm works with other Ring products to protect every corner of your home. It works with one simple app. You can look at your home anywhere, right from your phone. If something's happening, Ring lets you know. It's peace of mind anytime knowing your home's protected. For a special offer, go to ring.com forward slash breakdown to start your Ring experience. I love that it's easy to set up. I love that it operates from one app. And I love that I don't have to have a ridiculous alarm system. This is the way to know what's going on in my home. And it's true. It gives you peace of mind and that's worth a lot. Protect your home anytime, anywhere with Ring Alarm. Go to ring.com slash breakdown for a special offer on a Ring Alarm security kit today. You can build the system that's right for your home and have it running in minutes. That's ring.com slash breakdown, ring.com slash breakdown. Jalen will know this. I, I, I listen to uh, a lot of The Ringer and uh, listen to Raja talk a lot, and they get into like the emotionality of trades and how that impacts players. And you know, I don't think we're done this topic, but Jalen, you, you moved around a lot. Um, obviously, the 2000s uh, s- s- final series is massive, and I'm very curious about like how you, how players. Re- reorganize their thinking af- after a series like that? Most of the players don't get to pick the journey. You don't get a chance to pick where you play. You definitely don't, don't get a chance to pick when it is. So there are only a few, you know, Tim Duncans and Kobe Bryant that, that get called their shot. Um, and then there's what you hope to be, and that's a veteran. That's somebody that's able to reinvent themselves based on their role, the team. Like right now, look at a player like Russell Westbrook. Hmm. The last couple of years, while averaging a triple-double, he still had to reinvent himself. That's a life skill that I've taken from sports. That's one of the reasons why I encourage young people to play sports, because of the life skills, the social skills, to teach you how to deal with success, how to teach you how to deal with failure, how to deal with your... Uh, anxiety, how to de- deal with your depression. It teaches you all of those lessons. And everybody's judging you at the same time. They're cheering every play. They're booing every play. They're writing about every play. They're posting about every play. Every clip is a highlight. Everybody trying to go viral. It's a ooh and ah, and na 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 na. It's like, wow. Like sp- sports teaches you so much so fast. And so once you get to the professional level, you got to understand if you're getting traded from Indiana to Chicago and the Bulls have the worst record in the league, at that time, it wasn't me saying, well, I'm not going. It's like, all right, I'm going to be there and I'm going to play tomorrow night. And that year, I played 83 games. And matter of fact, now I think about that. They owe me a game check. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I just not thought about that. And so, like, you just you just have to have to reinvent yourself. You have to be a professional. And you have to master your role. And this is mm-hmm. another life skill. Like when you look in yourself in the mirror, do you see yourself with honesty or do you see your representative mm-hmm. not, not facing reality? And so those are the times as a professional athlete that you use those life skills to still find a way to go and perform and be your best because that's your job. You and I are the same person, Jalen. We're the same 
person. I feel the same <laughs> way about being a performer because it's true. It's like, I have to do my job whether you watch it or not. I have to do my job sure. whether you watch the rerun or not. I have to show up and no matter what is going on around me. Correct. And I remember I worked, but my father, I remember this. My father died while I was working on the Big Bang Theory. Like wow. that was a thing that happened and you don't get a week off. You don't get to, like I had a horrible car accident. I had to, like I went to work like on the drugs, you know, like I still couldn't feel my arm. Um, but I wanted to say this is a great place to lead into one of one of the really like, your book's really fun. There's fun things. Jalen's Friendly Guide to Trash Talking. And I'd like to talk <laughs> about this because, because two reasons. Jonathan and I, well, I watched it twice, but Jonathan and I just watched The Malice at the Palace about yeah. the, you know, the Detroit pace. Like it was, it's, it's a great documentary. And so I had already seen it and then we watched it again. And one of the really interesting parts that O'Neill was talking about is like, the and Steven Jackson was also talking about it too. A lot of people don't understand when they look at games that like, y'all know each other. And sure. there's a certain amount of gameplay that that we like to watch as the public, but it's not always just what you want as if you're watching on a TV screen. These are like, the, there's people interacting on a court. And so th that's the first reason I wanted to kind of talk about your five points of, of uh, trash talking because it's terrifying to me when I see trash talk. It's, t I get, I mean, <laughs> I also, I don't watch hockey for this reason because I don't believe fighting belongs in a sport unless it's boxing. Right. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason is Jonathan and I trash talk each other all the time. I've never, I've never dated a person who talks so much trash, but it's, I totally like, it's fun. I, I sometimes get my feelings hurt, but I would. It was your mistake. Very early <laughs> on, she said to me, never let a joke pass. <laughs> so he, he lets them all go. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I'm in a relationship with someone where it's just brutal. It's so brutal. And I'm like, is this what it's like to be an NBA player? I just trash talk. So your guide to trash talking, number one, respect your opponent. Number two, be prepared to deal with the consequences. Number three, nothing is out of bounds. Number four, do your research. It pays off. Number five, win. This is very dangerous, Jalen. Yes. And, 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 and first off, the respect your opponent part really is, you can watch to the edge of the pool, but there's certain things that are just out of bounds. <laughs> The, the significant other, the kid, you know, like, you know, you know, negative mouths in someone's family, like, like th those things are out of bounds. And, and, and that those are the things that actually lead to the altercations when, right. when it goes too far. That's when it's like, oh, seriously, you're going to go there? Or it's like that? And then push, 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 and boom, it's on. Basically, that's how things escalate when you walk to, when you go too far with your trash talk. But also, you, you do have to do your research because it's like an audience. So, like, when the NBA started back, you noticed there were some altercations where the fans went too far, right? Throwing bottles at players and spitting on Trey Young at the Garden. No. Like, 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 players, like, the audience went too far. And this is why I did a guide to trash talk. Hmm. Here's where you know it goes too far. Either when you're... You're, you're with multiple curse words and name calling. Mm. Like, chants have always been creative. Chants defense or whatever, like, it, 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 and you could be mean if you're funny. Like, at the garden, <laughs> you know, like, they, 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 have some, they have some clever chants for players, and, and you do that around the league. And so it, it rarely escalates, though. It, re it rarely does. So this is actually, I'd really like to ask you about this because it's also been current in the sports world, and um, I, I will watch any sports documentary. So I've pretty much seen all of them. Um, and I remember that, you know, I was I was raised, you know, my dad grew up playing stickball in the street and, you know, like racquetball was the most sophisticated sport in my family because like that's just we couldn't afford other sports and that's what we did. And basically like, you know, playing ball against a wall was like our idea of a good time. You know, my dad raised me to be a, 
um, a good loser, <laughs> not because I was bad at things, but just it was considered gentlemanly, you know, and I don't mean to use a gendered term, but my dad was born in, in 1942 and right. you'd be a good winner, you'd be a good loser. Like that's the thing. And when, when I was in college, I learned from the person that I eventually married and had kids with and were divorced, you know, we never boo the other team. And I loved that because we were the fiercest patriots for, for the Bruins, but I didn't, I loved it. I never booed the other team. Did we tease the other team? If someone did an air ball, every time he got the ball, we would scream, air yeah. ball, fine. Yeah. But what I've noticed is that as our culture has gotten more aggressive, meaning I've been given the finger more times driving for things that usually in the old days, people just would have been like, whoa, let's give a little honk, you know? Right. People, people are so aggressive now actively and I think it's extended to sports and I think it's disgusting. But the question I wanted to ask you is, I just watched the Naomi Osaka documentary and right. um, you know, I th obviously Simone Biles has been in the press for comments about mental health and and there's this kind of like, I go back and forth where on the, and I remember when Dennis Rodman was playing, you know, and like we had never seen someone like Dennis Rodman and we were like, he, you know, he's so unusual and this, and like, he's got this. And we were scrutinizing everything he did and it got to be a lot. And then when you see Meta and you see him talking in this documentary about the impact that this pressure had on him and what was going on with him, like, I, I want to know, like, does this trash talking, like, is there a point that you have to be a certain amount of strong and resilient? Can you be a sensitive, vulnerable person and still compete at this level? Like, and I'm not asking you to, like, fix it, but, you know, people say to me, like, oh, aren't you proud of, you know, insert athlete here for talking about mental health? And I say, absolutely, but you're up against challenges that are exceptional. The pressure is enormous, and I don't know how you just say, like, I mean, Meta said, he's like, I didn't know what to do, so I laid down, you know? What's your take okay. on that? And um, I love um, Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka, and I applaud their courage because it's now being acknowledged about mental health issues and PTSD. Those just things we didn't talk about in the 80s and the 90s. They existed. I went up for a slam dunk in high school, got clothesline, fell on the back of my head, went into convulsions and got carried off in an ambulance. There has to be some lingering effects of that. Hmm. From the streets of Detroit, Michigan, I've seen and heard a lot of stuff um, for a young, uh, uh, impressionable mind. Hmm. And so sports is an escape, just like Acting is an escape, but it's not, <clears throat> it doesn't make you exempt. Mm. And it, it, it creates more pressure. Just imagine being Simone Biles. Mm. In basketball, I could miss a shot. I could have a turnover. Like she got to stick the landing and get a 10. Imagine that everything you did all day had to be a 10. Mm. Like, have you ever really watched like the routine, I think like, how do you practice that? <laughs> I think that too. What's the first time you try and do that well, quadruple? You got a ball. I know. You know what I'm saying? Like, how, how do you practice that? Like, that that's different. Like, that, like the, that level of pressure, that level of concentration, that, 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 that that's way different than like being, uh, a basketball player, a football player, you can get penalties. An actor, you just, hey, cut, do it again, do it again, do it again, right? They get one time to do it. And so they're so very young, too. Like, how old are they? Like, I, I remember being a member of the Fab Five, and I just told this story recently. We were about to do an interview on CBS, and all five of us were sitting there, it was at the practice. And I remember thinking, man, I'm broke. My skin is bad. My teeth are bad. I don't have a haircut. Like, I don't really want to do an interview on CBS right now. Like, do I even deserve to be here mm. right now? And so I understand what, what they go through with such young minds having to make adult professional decisions. You know, 
Like life changes when all of your bills are in your name. Hmm. That's when that's when life changes. When all of your bills are in your name. And for them, that happens young. Hmm. Man, that happens young. Like 18, 19, 20. And then the other thing about Simone Biles, she continues to work at a place where she was assault, assaulted by Larry Nasser. That that's a whole other, yes. Right. So she still goes into the same environment, performs her task in that same environment that allow her to be assaulted. Do you think there's a component here of, of inequality about attention because of our relationship with black people in this country? Inequality. Meaning I feel like if a lot of the pressures and things that had happened to these athletes had happened to, to white athletes, I think people would have been interested before this kind of notion of like, well, this is what they're they're supposed to do. They're supposed to play, and I don't want to hear it. I'll tell you guys two words in, in no particular order. Jealousy and money. Hmm. That's all it is. Like, we live in the United States of America. I can't, I can't help that you guys value sports more than you value education. Hmm. You pay me millions of dollars to play basketball, but you won't pay teachers $100,000 to educate your kids. Like, would you pay, pay, pay to be entertained, right? And so what ends up happening is you get treated as property based on your salary. I remember being a college athlete and trying to figure, like, why we're not getting paid for our name, image, and likeness. Well, now since it's happened in 30 years later, yeah. 30 years later, I remember people that I either now work with or see them in the public eye that have either changed their stances because they were like the public. And what did the public say? Just shut up and be happy you got a scholarship. That's it. Oh, if I was you, I wouldn't be complaining. You got somebody giving you X amount of dollars paying That's for it. your education. Like, I'm paying for my education with my talent. What are you talking about? That's how America works. And so I think... There was also a jealousy factor from the public that envied the kind of money. Oh, you they get paid millions of dollars just to play a sport. Like, Well, that's and that's what happened in, with Malice at the Palace. I mean, I will not I won't say what Steven Jackson said, but there was this notion also of like, why are they behaving like this? You know, and every and I mean, the documentary does it so well. It's like thugs, thug. They're such thugs. They need to clean up their act. And it's like it's so it's such an example of a, a larger injustice. The the last thing I wanted to ask you about is one thing I really appreciated about your book, and I think there's a special sensitivity to it, especially because of who your dad was and how how that came to be, which is not my business, um, but. There's a real sensitivity in your book to the flashy things that a lot of people want to hear about. And several times in the book, you you kind of answer the question for people. And, you know, as a person who is a, a diehard sports lover and, and also a very strong feminist, I do have a lot of conflict about the way we talk about women, especially, you know, in in the realms that that you know people are interested in. I do really appreciate that you're uh, reasonably respectful, you know, t meaning you don't you don't talk about exploits and things like that. And it's really it's not my business, but I appreciate that you addressed it kind of like we're not going to talk about this. But one of the things you do talk about and not in a gratuitous way is money. Mm -hmm. You know, as someone who grew up um, where we did not have enough water often for it to be hot, you know, for more than one human. Um, I really appreciate the way you speak about money because, you know, you said white people call it staff, right? But if, if you're black, it's, oh, your entourage. But you specifically said that there were about 20 people, so let's just call it, you know, a baker's two dozen or so, yes. um, that you felt, uh, I mean, it makes me very emotional, that, that you felt a specific obligation, you know, to yeah. kind of address and and it's not like oh here's the things i bought for this person like it was really sweet your mom didn't want a house you know <laughs> like you finally had to convince her to like do a condo but can you talk a little bit not from a like flashy tell me how much you spent kind of way but 
in that sense, because like I have a love hate relationship with money, you know, it does a well, lot of beautiful things and can help a lot of people, but it can also be your downfall and the God that you worship in this culture. You know, right. what did it, what was it like kind of in terms of, you know, if you think about like your mental health, meaning what you wanted to give back, what was that like? And, and was that just like, did you make a list? Did it just sort of start <laughs> happening? Like, how did that work? It, it, it's a part of the dream. It's a part of the goal. And the one thing I always try to talk to young people about is endurance. Like, like even just look at like it, going to school, like K through 12, and then a couple of years of college. Before you know it, that's, that's 15 to 18 years of your life. That's, that's, that's real equity. And a lot of things change. A lot of turbulence happens uh, in, in somebody's life. And so it, it becomes a part of the dream initially that I'm going to make it big. And when I make it big, I'm going to do all of these amazing things for the people that help me get there. Um, and in my situation, most of those people were poor or broke once I got there. Mm -hmm. So it's different when you walk across the stage and you get drafted and your family already lives in the suburbs mm -hmm. versus you're trying to move your entire family to the suburbs. It's almost like, uh, um, what's the show? It's almost like the Beverly Hillbillies, <laughs> right? You know, those visuals. I, I have those mental visuals walk, watching me and my family move to the suburbs mm. in, in, in our own sort of way, right? And your relatives and your friends. And what you end up learning is maintenance, and managing those situations a lot of times become a part of a fracture that can take place in those relationships because of what you just alluded to. Because some people expect you to take care of them forever. Like, this ain't retirement. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, uh, it, it's, it's sometimes it doesn't end. <laughs> right. This ain't retirement. And I, was, and I was saying this to somebody the other day. If you ever run across somebody on the face of this earth that says that they know me or they're a former friend of mine and or they don't like me, ask them how much money have I ever given them? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Those are the people that hate me the most. <laughs> they hate me the most. You know, people that I reached in my pocket and gave my Benjamin Franklin's to to try to help them feed themselves. And put them in position for their goals. But in all honesty, you gotta, you gotta, the goal has to be to teach people how to fish. And unfortunately, um, you can't want it for your family and or friends more than they want it for themselves. So everybody got to have a plan, work the plan, try to put them in position to chase their goals. People think, oh, they get paid to play a game. You guys put in work, crazy work. After all the years on the court, what does your body feel like now when you wake up in the morning? That's a great question. And one of the reasons why I retired is because I had bad tendonitis in my knee and I had a partial tear in my right ACL. And to this day, I still not have it. I still haven't had it operated on. Hmm. Right. So as a left handed player jumping off of my right leg. That's right. So my right knee is jacked up. If I if I do some squats or whatever, it's, it's like you can hear like <laughs> like lightning and clouds. It's called like, crepitus. That's the yeah, clinical term. Crepitus. Right. Um, the, my left left handed player. So my left shoulder, just wear and tear, shooting the ball, dribbling the ball, being left hand dominant, that type of thing. My left shoulder. Um, I broke my left hand before, mm. and it was my fourth metacarpal. So I have a plate and five screws in my hand. I got a bionic hand. Um, that The plates hold my hand together or it'd be shattered. So if, I, I guess I could never go to a bar and get into a bar fight because I'm going to have to hit the person with a bottle or something or my hand <laughs> would be shattered, right? I'll fight for you, Jalen. I'll fight. You take me to the bar, I, I fight you. for I you. I appreciate that. And so like th those are just like casualties of battle. But to be honest with you, like, I'm extremely healthy. I, I'm really fortunate psychologically, physically, emotionally, financially. Like, so I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really fortunate. And you have kids. Yeah. Yes. My oldest is a senior at the University of Georgia. Her wow. name is Mariah. She's 
the next great um, super broadcaster and uh, entertainer. She's in their uh, school of broadcast. She's doing wow. great. My youngest is Gracie. Um, she's a sophomore. She plays volleyball. They're both in Georgia. She's doing her thing. She's spiking on people. She's going to break somebody's nose this year. Respectfully. <laughs> respectfully. Respectfully. Within the sport. Within the sport. Just, just spiking on it. Just spiking. But no, like, I'm, I'm really fortunate. And I'm glad you guys do this on mental health, too. And I'm glad you guys acknowledge that because uh, as, as we're around the same age, there, there was a period of time with, like, just, just, you know, just toughen up. Just shut up. That's right. You being soft. You being weak. You, you, you know, and I can use a lot of the terms that we know are derogatory that I shouldn't use yeah. that people will call you as well. And so uh, uh, this, this gives people the courage to be the best version of themselves and express themselves. So thank you, guys. While we love you as a basketball player, we also love you as a media member. I listen to a lot of Jalen and Jacoby. Love your thank takes on things. We could spend all time. All you know, another hour, which we won't, on what's going to happen this NBA season. No, but, no, but I'm going to be going. I'm going to be listening to him on YouTube <laughs> and hearing his shout outs. So and I'll come back on during the season. No worries. Oh my gosh! There we go. We, we need a sec- we need a second podcast because the two of us watching basketball together is hysterical. No, she she's extremely animated. I'm, I'm I take a- videos of her watching, <laughs> and she's like. <laughs> You can't even imagine what no, she's like. I lose like. my mind. She's and, screaming. And she's I, sweating. I also, I let's just, let's just talk about it. I love baseball. Like I was raised a Yankees fan. My parents were born in the Bronx. Like my father was born in the middle of the war. Like Jackie Robinson. Like that's right. what I was raised on. So like I love baseball. I'll sit and watch eighty six innings with a beer and a veggie dog. I'll watch that all day. I love football, but basketball. I mean, that's where my that's energy where you sweat. Is. I, I lose my mind. I she cry. goes hoarse by the end of the game. Oh, it's insane. Anyway, okay. All right. Rapid fire okay. with Jalen Rose. What was your mother right about? If you can't talk to me, you can't ask me for anything. It's a good one. That is a good one. What's the location in the world that promotes your best mental health? Detroit, Michigan, my hometown. It seems like when I'm there, um, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's just home. Like, I love being in California and I love being in New York and I love being in Florida. Um, but 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 Detroit um, has done so much for me and it still has so much potential and promise that I want to see happen. So definitely being in Detroit. I love that. Do you have a mantra? Like one thing that you say to yourself? People come into your life for four reasons. To add, subtract, multiply or divide choose wisely Woo! nice i love that Mm -hmm. who's been your best spiritual teacher the man above death definitely Hmm. um i don't talk about it a lot publicly everybody chooses you know to approach you know how they deal with their faith or whatnot but um, i have extremely strong faith i'm a god-fearing man and uh, uh i i i do all things through him who are you most competitive with? I'm most competitive with myself. <laughs> I'm my toughest critic. And I embrace my critics. Like I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm the kind of person to tell people that sometimes your critics are right. Mm. And I pay attention to the noise. I don't I don't ignore the mm. noise. And I, I'm willing to continue to work to get better. And, and and sometimes, like, I, I like the fuel that knowing, I, to be honest with you, sometimes I like, I, sometimes I'm fueled off the fact that there are people that have never met me that don't like me. Same. We're the same person, Jalen. We're the same person. <laughs> last, last question. What's been your moment of best intuition when you were like, I made the right decision because my gut told me to do that? To go to Michigan. Hmm. You know, a lot of people don't realize I wore number 42 in high school. That's right. My biological father wore 24, 24. and I did it out of spite. And I was like, he going to know my name one day. I'm going to be the opposite oh. of him. I'm going to be better than him. I'm going to do everything, everything, everything. So I'm going to wear the opposite number. And so when I got to Michigan, I was trying to release that negativity. And plus, I wanted a single number. I'm like, I need a single digit. I'm 6'8". We're running a point. Magic was 32. 
I got to do that, no doubt. And then what actually happened, though, Chris Weber was the fourth person to commit. And he wore 44 in high school. And first we were talking about getting 14 and 15. And I didn't want to be a point guard wearing 15 because I, I love Earl DePearl so much. I was like, I can't be, I can't be acting like I'm Earl DePearl. I ain't no Earl DePearl. <laughs> Forget that. And so he took four and I was the fifth person to sign my letter of intent. Mm -hmm. That's how I got number five. Wow. Um, I do want to ask one more thing because it's, it's very unpopular to talk about God. And I'm a person that has chosen to do it um, because you and I are the same person. So I did want to ask, because when you say that you're a God-fearing person, I, I use that phrase. And, you know, as a person who speaks Hebrew and reads the Old Testament and, you know, studied biblical Hebrew, like there's a very specific concept to living. It's, it's not so much, it's not just fear. It's also awe. Meaning to be in a state of wonder about the fact that we exist, the gifts that we've been given, the challenges that we've been given. And the notion is not to fear like, oh, someone's constantly going to like strike me down if I say a bad word or that kind of, you know, being consumed by fear. But the notion that I always know that I didn't create this, I don't really have control over it. And everything mm -hmm. I do is is to literally be an example of something that is always going to be larger, more powerful, and hopefully holds more capacity for good than I do. Can you talk a little bit just about that concept of fear? And, and you know, are you a person that, like, prays every day or you just kind of have this notion of, you know, a God in heaven? What does it feel like for you? Yes, ma'am. And since you're asking me, I will. Absolutely. So, um, um, the Lord and church and coming from a, uh, a family of faith has always been a part of my life. Hmm. I was essentially raised by my grandmother and my mother. And I lost my grandmother less than two years ago, and she was 103. Wow. So when I was young, we went to church every Sunday. It was, it was, it was not an option. <laughs> and that became just as important as anything else. It became just as important as school. It became just as important as sports. If you don't take care of one of the three or two of the three, one of the two of the three, they ain't just ain't going to happen. That's just, that just how it was. And I remember one time when I was getting in trouble in school, like around fifth or sixth grade, I went to St. Cecilia. And uh, that's the basketball mecca of Detroit. And uh, I got in trouble. My mother took me off the team. And, you know, one of the things I didn't understand is not only did she took me off the team, but she told me God told her to take me off the team. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, a guy, I, I, hold on, wait, hold on, like, hold on, man. Did, did he say that? Like, hold on, like, me and you supposed to have our own relationship. Like, mm. what, you know, what's going on here? And, and, and like any kid that's ever slammed the door behind their parents, oh, I hate you. You know, whatever, whatever. It, it's the same thing. But what I started to learn to do is, be faithful and be consistent and be still and know that he's God. One of my first tattoos when I was uh, really young says God's favorite. Like I have a faith side of tattoos. I have one uh, with the, a cross that's bleeding that says seek the truth and says salvation underneath. I have angels on the back of my forearm and on the inside I have like... God's face. Yeah. That's God's favorite. Same. Probably. We have the same tattoos. How did that happen? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let me tell you something. On the way to this interview today, I was riding up Sunset Boulevard. I passed Barrington in Bel Air. At that light, in September 3rd of 2002 or 2003, I survived an assassination carjacking mm. attempt at that corner. It's in the book. Right at that corner. I stopped at that light right before, like 30 minutes before you saw me. Mm. And I have those forensic pictures of that Bentley that got hit with a nine millimeter nine times. Got hit with a nine millimeter nine times. And my longtime friend, Rory, who was in the car with me, the bullet hit the headrest and by the grace, slowed down as they said, 
and went into his cheek and then went into his neck. And driving that car with your with your good friend bleeding everywhere and the car smoking everywhere and realizing that I'm not dead. Like there is a God. He's brought us all through stuff that we don't recognize. Your, your, your example might not be as vivid as mine, but what you don't realize is it probably happened five minutes after you left or a few minutes before you got there. Grace. I mean, that's what the word grace is. You know, we say there, but for the grace of God, go I, right? <laughs> my, my oldest daughter, middle name is Christian. Mm-hmm. And since you just said Grace, my youngest daughter name is Sophia Grace. We call her wow. Grace. You're amazing. And I am so grateful that you came to talk to Like, I couldn't believe it. When they said we got you, I was like, what? <laughs> and I'm going to get to talk to you for your podcast. Uh, we'll set that up so that we can talk about all all good things Jeopardy. Um, but what a, what a blessing you are. And it's just, it's so... It's so beautiful to get to have this conversation with someone that we've both watched. You're you're a tremendous legend, but the Thanks. power of like your heart and your words and your experiences is just so tremendous. And this was amazing. Speaking of his podcast, Jalen, tell us where we can find your stuff, as I say. <laughs> Anywhere you get uh, podcasts on Apple or Spotify, check out The Renaissance Man. I also write a column each week in the New York Post. I can't wait to have you on my show. And not only am I going to interview you, but I'm going to give you a framed copy of what they put in the post that week to show my gratitude. Stop it. Each one of the guests. Absolutely. The New York Post is next to the Bible for me. That's amazing. (laughs) Got your back. No question. I got your back. All right. One day we do a lobster dinner with Jalen. I do not eat lobster. I'm kosher. You missed that part of the Old Testament, my friend. So I'll tell you this. Whether you guys are watching sports, whether it's Jeopardy, let's make sure we catch up. We love you. Thank you. This is so awesome. Thank you. God bless you. You take care. God bless you as well. Y'all have a good one. We got to like, we got to peek behind the curtain of like Jalen Rose. He told us all the crazy stuff that his body has endured over the years. And I want to know, what does it feel like in the morning when he first opens his eyes? He must open his eyes and think, I'm Jalen Rose. This is amazing. I think he opens his eyes and is like, uh, my shoulder, and then he like warms it up, and then he's like on to his day. I think it's kind of creepy that you keep wanting to know what it's like when he wakes up. Because <laughs> that's where the body is hurts the most. I just, I love how he talks about his family and his mom, and I just <laughs> loved everything about it. His glasses? Why is he so cool? You want to get the same glasses as him? He's, I think I should. I mean, we're the same person. It's only fitting. He's also the founder of the Jalen Rose Leadership Academy, which is an open enrollment, tuition-free public charter school in his hometown of Detroit. Love his love for Detroit, for his hometown. Uh, The school's mission is to empower scholars to develop strength of character, skills, and knowledge needed to matriculate. Ooh, it's fancy. So that they have opportunities to be successful in the competitive world and take care of themselves and the people they love. They have a 97% graduation rate. 100% college and post-secondary acceptance, and they're the number one rank for open enrollment high schools in Detroit for college matriculation. I mean, I haven't used that word in a minute. He seems to be a really genuine person. I know that, like, athletes have to have foundations, and they have to do this, and they talk about giving back, but he seems really, he seems like a very genuine person. So obviously I didn't know him before this interview at all, uh, meaning, like, I've never spoken to him. Really? We've never hung out. Oh, that's weird. Okay. But I read the Bill Simmons intro, and Bill Simmons just talks about what an amazing human being he is and how much uh, he, people enjoy being around him. And when I read that, I'm just like, wow. He's very charismatic. Yeah, very charismatic, very authentic. Yeah. And, you know, I, I believe Bill Simmons. What, what, what am I going to say? <laughs> um, well, and also, I, I should say... You know, there's also uh, there's there's stuff in his book about his love for cars and like his bracelet that was like expensive as a house and, you know, all the things that that he he did and bought. But um, very, very interesting he has a very interesting lens also. Um, and the book is really, really enjoyable. It is called Got to Give the People What They Want by Jalen Rose. As you mentioned, he he has ADHD. We didn't even get to cover it. Mm-hmm. We get a lot of uh, requests to talk about ADHD, adult ADHD, how brains are different between uh, the different different types of people who who may have that condition. If you want to ask Mayim a question, you can do so 
at BialikBreakdown.com. That's B-I-A-L-I-K. Breakdown.com. And check out the Instagram page at Bialik Breakdown. Let's do an Ask Why I'm Anything. Okay, I was thinking of trash talking you. But oh, oh, let's do that first. No, no, it's fine. No, you go. No, it's going to get mean fast. He said you can't talk about people's mom. That's my favorite thing to give you shit about. So you're already doing it wrong. Talk. Oh, I've done my research. That's trash talk right you're there. You're so sensitive. I can't even pick on you about your mom. <laughs> Why are you so sensitive, bro? You're not allowed to name call. That's another <laughs> thing. Your head's a funny shape. <laughs> what type of funny shape is it's it? It's got a weird shape in the back. <laughs> That's why I wear my hat. Your hair fell out in a weird pattern. (laughs) Why shave it? What else? Keep going. This is good. You're doing well. What about my extra ankles? Should I be writing? (laughs) Should I be writing your trash talking? I say that Jonathan's essentially a newborn giraffe. (laughs) And I say he has gorilla arms because I literally think they hit the ground. You'll be like, oh shit, I wish you could reach that thing. And he's like, go, go, gadget arms. He can reach anything. Sometimes I say you want to put some food through that hole where your tooth should be. <laughs> oh, that went too far. <laughs> I think this game is over. <laughs> I'm a very uh, aggressive athlete back in the day. You're just aggressive. When I, when I, <laughs> I am. I'm very aggressive. Who are you most competitive with? Once you. <laughs> I'm the only person who, when I ask that question of our guests, like, oh, who are you most competitive with? Myself. That's not true. What are you competitive with me about? Just name. What do you got? My height. Yes, I, I. I mean, I can't compete about it. I have. I have envy about it. My deep, soothing voice. You do have a very nice voice. What else? <laughs> this is really, really delightful, and there's no one I would rather talk to Jalen Rose with than you. Thank you, Mayim. We have an ask Mayim anything or no? No. No. But Cassandra still, asks, oh. do you find it difficult to balance science and, with religion? No. I myself am more agnostic, but find it encouraging when people can combine humanity with their faith. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. I also am happy to direct people. I did a YouTube video about, you know, science and God or religion and God. It is a, a famous saying that I got from my rabbi. He did not say it, but he passed it on. If you think that the Bible is a science book. I've got better science books for you. It's not a science book. And even the most religious people don't believe that it is. Um, and I'm speaking for religious people. The notion of truth is is a very amorphous one in, in all religion and really in our existence in general. And everything I've ever learned about science makes me sure that I couldn't create it and can't change it. And everything that I've learned about religion has given me a way to appreciate the world of science with tremendous awe and 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 trembling. I'm floored by the mysteries of the universe. And to me, I call that divine, and you don't have to. That's a really good answer. Why, thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Cassandra, for uh, asking. Thank you, Cassandra. Wow, what a great day. We got to meet Jalen Rose. Can't complain about that. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have, we will see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction one. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down.